Welcome back to the Pitch and Pass podcast hosted by Sal Asante, yours truly. And on the sticks over here, we got Daniel, my man, taking producing over. In our last episode, we did a brief introduction to the podcast as well as introduce both teams that I'll be heavily focusing on. Now, last episode, it was very quick looking at the New York Yankees. And this episode, we're going to be blowing that up. All right, we're going to be taking that into a little bit deeper depths, talking about what happened this past season, what happened in the off season, the moves that we made and the moves that we hope to make, and looking ahead to the next season, 2024, and seeing what our prospects are and the chances that we have to take down the Orioles after such a good season. So without any further ado, let's get into it. for the Yankees have been, well, not like the Yankees, right? We're not used to missing the postseason. No. I say that with a caveat. The last time that we missed the postseason, I believe the next season, we, well, that's not true. We missed, what did we miss, Danny? 2014, 2013, we missed or something like that. Time before that, 2008, next season, we won the World Series. So when you think about possibilities for the Yankees or, or hoping that we could move on from our failings last year, the inability to face down opponents in our own division that, you know, kind of make fun of us at this point for not being able to beat them. Talking about the Blue Jays, talking about the Rays, right? The Rays even had their star shortstop plucked off the field for talking to minors, and yet we still can't beat them. Okay. So we got some real issues. All right. Now, when we talk about, I get, let's get back on topic. I had to throw a zinger in there, right? 2023 what what do i really think was was the downfall right because we didn't even get into the postseason to see what's been the biggest issue i think in yankees recent past right which is just flopping in the postseason but we'll get to that in a little bit last season 2023 i think the biggest issue was staying healthy honestly if you want to be raising young players like a volpe or you want to be bringing people up like a dominguez you want to bring them up in an environment where you have Older players who are going to mentor them, of course, but also star players who are going to be there and give them an example of this is what the Yankee way is supposed to be. The Yankee way no longer represents what it used to be back in the 90s when we used to have our star-studded lineups every single year, year in, year out, with not only a bullpen, but also a heck of a starting rotation to boot, right? You just didn't have holes. You talk about the Yankees now, you're talking about a crapshoot in which you're hoping that one category is strong enough to beat all the other teams just based on that one category. And in recent past, it's been power. And no, I just got to, we got to face the, face the writing on the wall here. It's just not working out. All right. When you talk about big power hitters, what you're also generally talking about is bigger, bulkier guys, guys who are actually not going to be on the field as much as you need them to be. We all know that baseball is a long-term stretch, right? It's a marathon type of season. It's not like the NFL. It's not like, you know, you miss five games in the NFL, you missed half the season. No, you miss five games in baseball, you're fine. It's when you miss five games and then another five games and then a 15-game stretch and then 20 games in August, right? And all of a sudden you add it up and instead of 150, 160 games played, you got 110, 120, and that was the case for Judge last year. Injury to his toe took out, I believe, what, 40 games from him. He had 110, 120 games played. And you couple that with a Radon, Carlos Radon, who's, I guess you could say, recovering, kind of injured all year. Don't know what you want to make of it. But those two in tandem, you're talking about this Judge getting paid $40 million already last year, I believe so. So you're, you're talking about you know, upwards of $70, $80 million that is not producing nearly as much as it needs to. And that's not even getting into the t- the fact that Giancarlo Stanton probably shouldn't even be on an MLB roster, let alone the New York Yankees. Okay, so these start to, uh, these big, big expenditures start to add up for the Yankees, right? And when they're sitting on the bench, it really makes it uh, pretty difficult for Cashman to go out and spend on any sort of help that's viable. Because right? you're looking at these these price tags that are coming down in the future, we just cannot afford to go out on too many more limbs. Now, you might want to say that you know, Cashman has a tough situation here, but I honestly couldn't disagree more. This is one of the biggest issues that the Yankees have is they can't move on from this guy, Cashman. All right? Cashman has gotten us into this hole that we see ourselves now in. Right? And it all stems back to what happened with 2009 
the massive, massive spending increase that came with that. Of course, we got a ring, but then you see that mentality start to take over of, all right, we're going to buy people who are past their prime and you just stack them all up on a lineup and it should work out together. Well, you get an A-Rod, you get a Teixeira, you get Jacoby Ellsbury, right? Now, of course, you're seeing it with Carlos Rodon, and I do not think you'll see that as the future, but that is what labeled 2023 as it was. All right. Now, let's get into a little bit more of the more distant past, but really still recent. Let's stay in the 2020s, 2019 area, right? We're talking about all of our postseason losses, and Danny, I want, to, I want you to take me through these. All right, so we had postseason years. We'll start in 2017, right? Because this is the year that we should have, everybody thinks that we should have won the World Series, right? If it wasn't for the banging trash can Astros, we would have won the World Series, okay? This is the year that Aaron Judge had his rookie season. We are supposed to take this all the way, right? So we took care of Minnesota Twins. Actually, I was at that game. Thought it was an awesome game to watch. We probably should have lost that game. Came back in the first inning, tied it up, and then took him over. Cleveland Indians went on to win 3-2 series, also a good series. And then we went on to Houston Astros. Like I said, this is the year that they were claiming to use trash cans to help them see the signs. And we lost 4-3. Okay. Now, if... I'm remembering this series correctly. You correct me if I'm wrong, Danny. This is a series where I believe Jose Altuve ended this with a home run off of Roldis Chapman. And if this is the series that I'm thinking about, right, that was the year that everybody knew. Roldis Chapman is not the guy that you want ending the game in the ninth inning. He's the guy that you want to be throwing at maybe the most stressful time. That's not the ninth inning. Because it seemed like the only thing he could do was blow saves that year. I believe he still had a good ERA, all right? But when you're talking about the, the job of a closer, or someone who's supposed to be used in a high leverage situation, they don't give up runs when you're not allowed to give up runs. When your back is against the wall, you don't give up runs. Okay. That is a situation we find ourselves again multiple times in the upcoming postseasons, right? So we get ourselves into a series with... Well, first we beat the Oakland Athletics in 2018, then we go on to the Boston Red Sox. Allegedly, they were cheating in 2018, right? And so look at the Yankees' mindset as you start to focus on this. Look at this. You're starting to say that we're going up against cheaters. We can't beat cheaters. Instead of just, you know, playing baseball. Danny, you grew up. You played baseball. How many times did you hear the phrase, if you're not cheating, you ain't trying? Right? That is a, base, that is a baseball saying. There's a baseball saying, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. So if somebody's getting away with something, and its I'm almost positive it's been documented that the Yankees also participated in the same cheating. So I want you guys to stop on that train, get off it. The honest fact is the Yankees flopped. They just flopped 2018. They opened the doors for the Red Sox to go get another championship, and that they did. All right? Go on to 2019. Who are we going to face again? Well, we took care of the Twins, had no problem with them, and then we got our four swept by Houston. Now, this was this was really when you start to see the colors get painted on the wall, which is the fact that we just can't handle a bullpen, right? We can't handle our pitching. Right? The, the Houston Astros aren't the type of team that's going to put up 18 runs in a game and just smother you. Houston Astros are a type of team that every time you make a mistake, they're going to take one run away from you, and they're going to continue to take one run away Every time you make a mistake, and that mistake might be a curveball hanging down the middle to Jordan Alvarez, or that mistake might be booting a ball as your second baseman and watching a guy take an extra base on you, which I know that Kyle Tucker and Jose Atuve did on us multiple times throughout the years. Okay. We get ourselves into these type of series. We can't be making those mistakes. All right, You need to hold yourself to a standard, and that's when I want to call back to the Yankee way in a way. right? We don't embody what the Yankees used to be anymore. It's just the honest, honest truth is as much as these guys claim they want to be in New York, there's a certain pressure that is to be held. There's a standard to be held to play for the New York Yankees. And to be honest, we have a whole bunch of wannabes on this team right now. Even Aaron Judge, the way that he leads the team is very odd to me. Now, Danny might disagree with this, but bringing in all sorts of different coaches, not really working well with the team aspect. and trying to it seems like make the situation about himself especially when it came to the contract situation and at this point is starting to take control of the team you you don't even it's not even hidden he's going to all these sorts of meetings with 
with Hal Cashman. And you just know as a Yankee fan, the decision is starting to be made by someone who, you know, let's face it, it isn't a part of the, the business side of baseball. When you start middling with stuff like that and you start having players getting their, their opinions influencing the decisions being made on a management side, you can only really hope for a crapshoot of luck because, the, like I said, they're a player, they're in on the field, they don't have that understanding. Now, what do you think, Danny? Move on. I think we should move on from from their past. I think we got to go uh, run scoring. And that is funny. That is funny that that's the biggest issue, too. So run scoring in the postseason has been really a recent downfall, right? You you think of old Yankee teams, and the whole reason they lost was the fact that another team was able to keep up with them scoring-wise. Right now, you're seeing over the past five, six years, games that the Yankees are losing, they're losing because they put up one, zero, two runs in a game when the other team just puts up three, four, five you're not going to be able to give your pitchers any sort of leeway and you're not going to be able to have the quality bullpen moves that I'm talking about need to be made. They're not going to be able to be consistently made if you never have a lead or you never have the run support that at least gives you a hope and a chance in these games. All right. And one of the biggest issues I think you have to point out is failings of players like judge, right? Jim Carlos Stanton not being on the field when it comes down to it. Right? Stuff like this, when you when you get down to playoff time, is extremely important, right? So the fact that you haven't had at bats leading up to the postseason, maybe right? guys like Glaber Torres, I don't know if he shows up for the postseason too much. When we go into the postseason, another thing to think about is we don't have offensive catchers anymore. When it's Gary Sanchez out, we don't have an offensive catcher, and I'm not saying you need an offensive catcher to to win in the MLB, but when you don't, your whole lineup needs to be studs. We don't have that. Right, we have a couple of good guys, and I think that you know, looking forward and looking at some of the moves that the Yankees have made in this most recent off season, for me, it doesn't give me hope. It makes me think that they think they're good enough. All right, I think we'll I think we'll get into that now as we start to start to talk about some of the things that they that the Yankees decided were the best moves for them this off season. So, as we were talking about earlier. The Yankees have a lot of money tied down to very few players. All right. You're talking about Garrett Cole has, was he eating up 32, 36, 34 million? Okay. You have Judge eating up 40. Radon's got to be eating up about 25, I think, something like that, 26 maybe. All right. You have Rizzo, who's going to be eating up about 20. Okay. Stanton, at this point, he's going down. He's either at 30 or 25 or something like that. It's five players. And you're almost adding up to $300 million there or $250 million there. Okay. So one of the biggest issues that the Yankees are having, and if you're any sort of follower of Yankees Twitter, or you try to keep up with Yankees fans and see what they're thinking is Yankees fans are upset. The Yankees aren't spending more. Okay. One of the things that the Yankees fans I wish would realize is that the Yankees have spent themselves into a hole. Okay. Look about look look at a team like the Dodgers. Okay, they took the last two or three seasons, I believe, to knock themselves below any sort of tax threshold, which allows them to actually go above the tax threshold this season and not see the same penalty that the Yankees would see. And now, mind you, I don't even think they're above the tax penalty, but that just goes to show how well they planned out this whole plan, which is obviously not a three five year plan. This is a decade plan. You're looking a decade ahead, trying to be a winner. Okay, they're going to be paying for this until 2045, but the hope is they have four or five World Series to profit off that. And honestly, I can't blame them. All right. Now, as a Yankees fan, what you can do is blame the Yankees for not doing this. You're supposed to be the smartest franchise in the whole in the whole game. Right? We're supposed to look up to you. You are. You got 27 rings. What they've done is try to keep themselves competitive every single year instead of have a down year every now and then. Now I'm not saying the Dodgers have had down years every now and then, but they've had years where let's face it last year going into the postseason, Yes, they had a good record. Everybody knew they were going to lose. Didn't know they were going to lose to the Diamondbacks. That was a little shocking. However, everybody knew that the Dodgers didn't have what it takes to go a long distance run. Their starting pitching just didn't have it. On top of that, they had one or two relievers and that's about it. The bullpen, uh, their lineup is fantastic, but everything else, we weren't going to be able to hold it together. 
the Yankees are always trying to stay in the mix, always trying to stay above water. When you do that, you put yourself, like I said, into a spending hole. They've gotten themselves to a point just to stay a little above average. They have to spend $320, $330, $340 million. If you want to be great, imagine how much money the Yankees would have to spend. They probably need to have player payroll somewhere in the margin of $400, $410, $415, $430, $430 maybe million, dollars, which is getting into the ballpark of Steve Cohen last year, maybe even a little higher. And you saw how quickly Steve Cohen was to sell off every single one of those players that he spent all that money on. That is, yeah, you're setting yourself up for failure. Okay. And I do think that is one of the reasons we haven't seen more moves this offseason. Now, caveat on that. Now let's talk about what they have done. Juan Soto, I think, is a great addition. Okay. You have a lefty bat, which we haven't had a good lefty bat in Yankee Stadium in a long time. That's not to take away from Anthony Rizzo, but that is to say that Rizzo's had some issues staying on the field the last couple of years. And when he is on the field, I don't know if anybody else notices this, but he does some pretty boneheaded things, especially on the base paths. And, well, just to be honest, what's the point of hitting a single if you're just going to run yourself into an out two plays later? There's not too much of a benefit there and just not that productive of, of a hitter or a ball player in general. So I hope that changes. I hope he becomes a little bit more productive this coming year. But that being said, we don't really have a lefty productive hitter. And now we have Juan Soto, which is fantastic. One hope, my one goal, of course, would be, can we get an extension for this guy? Because at this moment, the guy is, the guy is 25 years old at the moment. Okay, All we have on him right now is an arbitration agreement for the highest arbitration number that there is. Okay, I'm sure what he's asking for is some sort of proof that we can win going into the future before he signs on long term. Because for him, he won at such an early age. I can only imagine that he either wants to be a lifelong winner or he wants to play for someone who he can go hide in a corner and go hit his baseballs far. Okay. It's either one. Not, it's, it's nothing else in between. I think the Yankees need to make an exception to spending a little bit more than they're comfortable with to get a guy who's going to be more productive for longer when you talk about him and Aaron Judge. You have lefty in Yankee Stadium, a guy who's younger, okay, and also a guy who's won a World Series before, right? So we, we can never really forget about that aspect of Juan Soto and how important I think that is to me as a Yankees fan. Okay. And one of the other additions that the Yankees were looking to make was get this guy out of Japan. Help me, Daniel. What was his name? Yeah, the one we didn't get. Yamamoto? Okay. Now, the Yankees were going after this guy hard, right? But as we mentioned back to what the Dodgers were doing, saving all this money up, of course, they go spend $700 million. That's in air quotes, by the way, $700 million for those of you just listening to audio. Of course, we now know that that salary is deferred 20 years and really the real time salary worth is, what is it, 46.8 or something, $46.8 million per year. Okay, so he's getting paid a little bit more than judge per year on average. That's, that's what it really turns out to all that did was allow them to sign the guy that we wanted. And the Dodgers knew we wanted him, but they wanted him more. They saved enough money to get both guys. And not only that, continue to add on bats, add on depth pieces for them. And, and for us, you know, we're just picking on their coattails at this point. And I say that not in a mean way, but let's just compare the star power of a guy like Yamamoto and a guy like Marcus Stroman, who the Yankees did go and sign. Okay? Marcus Stroman has no issues in my mind. One of the things that Yankees fan will be quick to call out is, I believe he said he could never play for the pinstripes because they're racist fans or something like that. I think he took the tweet down or took the stuff down by now, but I think it's long past overdue. When you talk about uh, one of my favorite podcasts, I don't know if any of you have heard this. Danny, let me know if you heard this, but the old owner of the Marlins has a podcast. His name is David Sampson. So it's called David Sampson, David Sampson Show. It's a fantastic podcast. All right. One of, the, one of the great points that he makes, he, he was a former executive, former president of the Marlins, and he talks contracts. He talks business about the sports. And one of the best points that he continually makes is it doesn't matter what the player wants. If the agent knows that that player's best deal and most amount of money is going to be made at a certain place where he has a deal, you good, Danny? 
Oh, no, I was making sure you were gandering off in the distance. I thought someone came in your room. Word. Uh, shit. So, what he, what, he, what he loves to talk about is that when players are signing contracts, probably the last thing that's talked about is where do you want to play? The first thing that they talk about, no matter what, is what is the money? And can I get more of it? And if a team is willing to give enough money for a player to, you know, one of the biggest things for Strom was most teams were more than likely just offering him one year flyer deal. The Yankees offered him, I believe it was two years guaranteed and a third year option. No team I can guarantee you has given Marcus Stroman a three year deal. And that's probably why he signed here. Nothing to do with where he wants to play. And I don't think he's going to play any differently than he would in any other state. Now, one of the things that could get someone like Marcus Stroman, similarly to a Joe Gallo or a Sonny Gray, one of the things that can take him to that point would be terrible fandom. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But it is a fact that has to be pointed out, and I hope it is rightfully pointed out by all Yankees fans and Yankee talking heads at this point, is that Yankee culture, Yankee fan culture is disgusting at this point. The treatment of players not not understanding how hard of a job they're doing. And then on top of that, the pressure that you're putting to, for them to do that, how much it makes players play on edge, how much it makes them not want to be in the city that is supposed to be welcoming them. Right? That is something that us as fans, I think, got to take on our own shoulders and realize that not only do we expect a hell of a lot out of these players, but kind of expect them to be gods in a way. We expect them not to be affected by human emotion. We expect them to take insults about their family, about their previous history, about their wives, about their kids, just because they're having a bad day on the ball field. All right. And I think that really we need to be prepared and honestly hopeful that as a fan base, we could hope for our team to maybe have some clarity in the coming years and maybe take a step back and say, we should regroup here. We should add up some young talent. We should have a really strong draft core for the next three years. Instead of go, going balls to the wall with signings, not understanding where our next next dollar is going to be spent, and also not understanding where that next dollar is going to be coming in from, because at this point you are alienating fans who are getting tired of a losing culture. Right? I'm not sure about you, Danny, but aren't you starting to gravitate more towards being a Philly fan than you are being a Yankee fan? Right? But a lot of that has to do based on the fact that the Phillies are putting on a winning mindset. And yeah, they don't go out and win 115, 120 games a year, right? They don't need to. They don't need to, okay? All they're showing is they put in the heart, they put in the soul, and they put in the want to be there. Right? When you see someone wants to be somewhere, they want to put in the effort, it shows immediately. And I, I think it's the the age-old saying that is, Hard work beats talent when talent don't work hard. All right? That's just, just a fact. All right? We're never going to... Yeah. All right, what's up? What we can do? Okay. As we look ahead into 2024 and where the Yankees could see themselves, all right? Now, one of the biggest things that you're going to look at as a Yankees fan is going to be a little bit of pullback from the Orioles. Okay, the reason that I say that is not guaranteed the Yankees, or excuse me, the Orioles are a very talented organization and they have a lot of young talent coming up as well. The other thing that they're playing off is their first 100 win season in God knows how long. When you have a team that is now being hunted by the entire AL and not just the AL East, not just your division, you have a team with a target on their back. I, I'm not guaranteeing anything, but there's a damn good chance that they're not getting above 95 wins next year. Now, it's on you as the Yankees to capitalize on that fall, okay? The Rays are also not nearly as talented as they were. The Red Sox are in the dumps, okay? The division is up to you to grab and honestly just prove that the Blue Jays and the Orioles can't outlast you in a marathon type of way. One thing that I would look for for the Yankees to do is capitalize on some of the guys that are going to be losing their contract status and are going to need big deals like an Aaron Judge, right? You're not talking maybe the size, but the scope of the contract, the years. And one of the biggest candidates I think should be prime for trying to shop, and I think they have been for the last couple of years not getting any biters, is Glaber Torres. 
Gleyber Torres is showing, I would say, probably some of the most value in his career, depending on who you ask. Some people would be saying he doesn't defend well as a second baseman and he's only a bat. And to that, I might say you're right. Another thing that you might say is he has been one of, if not the most valuable bats at second base for the last few seasons now. And his OPS plus and his, honestly, his slugging percentage is just, just one number you could look at. And he's been a very productive bat. There's no reason for the Yankees to extend this guy for multiple years at what is going to end up guarantee you to be 15, anywhere between probably 13 and $18 million a year, possibly up to 20. Talking about spending that much money on a guy who realistically could be replaced tomorrow pretty well with Peraza. Doesn't make too much sense to me to hold on to him too much longer. And that's also not talking about any of the depth that you have that's hiding in AAA. That's really just 4A players, really will never be Yankees. My point being is that's the time to trade Torres. Time to trade Torres is to find out what you got a little bit below him. Right? There's no way they're moving on from Volpe, and I do not think they should. One of those people that really thinks that the value on Volpe has not been realized yet. I think he's very young. I think he's, uh, I would say he's got a little bit of an overconfidence issue. All right. And maybe by now he's a little bit humbled and realizes that he's got a long career ahead of him. Not only that, he's got a lot of growing and learning to do in this league in order to be a productive baseball player day in, day out. Now, they gave him the gold glove. I'm not sure if that was 100% deserved. But what I do know is I think that's motivation for him to continue to get better. Okay. And there's no reason for us, I think, to sell out on that too early. Okay. Just because he had, Daniel might have to correct me if I'm wrong, something like the 212 range, 215 batting range. Right? That's a pretty disappointing and ugly figure as a Yankees fan to see as a batting average on a shortstop, especially having the luxury of watching Derek Jeter for 15, 20 years. But sorry to tell you that. The new normal and shortstop plays fantastic defense, which Volpe does play good defense, and they also don't hit. Now, another thing that I did want to talk about is our catcher situation, something that I would really hope that the Yankees do address in an upcoming move coming in 2024. I am not a fan of holding on to a Jose Trevino-type player as a long-term catcher. Right. And the reason being is, I think it kind of called back to it before, is you're very limited in your lineup options. When you do not have a productive catcher that can hit, okay, and I'm sorry, but Trevino is not a very productive bat. I think his OPS plus floats somewhere in the 60 or 70s consistently. And when you have that far below average production, the catching position, it puts such a strain on your other positions. And not only that, he's getting older. His production behind the plate is going down. And to be honest, I wouldn't classify him as an elite fielder anymore. And I do think that would be a very good upgrade opportunity for the Yankees to also shed away some of that uh, that young talent in AAA and AA that is just getting way too old at this point. Now, as we get any further in this, Danny, what else we got to talk about? We got to cover anything? Maybe another free agent ac- acquisition? Okay. So before we cut out today, I do want to keep going, Danny. Before we get out of here today, I do want to just say one hopeful. Now, I don't think the Yankees have what you like to call in New York the Gahonies to go out and make this move. However, I would love to see it. And that is the signing of Blake Snell. Now, signing of Blake Snell, what does that mean for us? Well, it's going to mean an almost identical contract to Carlos Rodon. So are we willing to spend another 20 to $26, 27000000 million a year on a pitcher who may be out next year? Right? That's the type of guy he is. I believe he's had at least Tommy Job once. He is the type of guy who does not get much more than 150 innings often. right? And he's also a big walk guy. So how do we feel about that as a Yankees fan base? Well, to me, I see a guy who won two Cy Youngs. I see a guy who is competitive in every shape and form. And a guy who wants to be on the ball field. And to be honest, I think if you put a Yankees uniform on him, there's a chance that he rises up to be the best pitcher in that rotation better than Garrett Cole. That's just my thought on it. Uh, Danny, do I got to visit anything else other than the fact that Blake Snell should be a Yankee and he will not be? Before we go too much further, I do want to do a way too early prediction on the Yankee season of 2024. Now, we will do a record prediction based on 162 game schedule. Remember, there is no game 163, so I am going to be either wrong or wrong or right on this guess. Way too early prediction. I'm going to say that the Yankees underperform again this year. I'm going to say that they might make the playoffs, though. 
and I'm going to give them a record that gives them a chance but does not guarantee them the playoffs, I think that they're going to get a 90, 90, 90 and 72 season. That's where I think they'll be at. All right. Now, if you enjoyed the episode, you thought that Denny and I did a good job here, or if you had any comments or concerns, or maybe you have a totally different take on the Yankees and what our future should be, or Maybe we had a fantastic last couple of years and you can't wait to tell me all about it. Well, hit me in the comments. Let me know down there below in the description. And when we come back next time, we will be hammering down just like we did here, the Yankees, my Dallas Cowboys, and our brutal loss to the Cheeseheads once again. Peace out.